Hello everyone, I'm David Holmes and welcome to this introductory video on Geometry Zen. Today I'm going to provide a brief answer to the question, what problem does Geometry Zen try to solve? In 2008 I was searching the web looking for the words geometry and physics and I came across a subject called geometric algebra. Now geometric algebra is a mathematical notation for describing the relationship between things in space. That's what geometry is. And I was really captivated by the elegance of the notation and really the powerfulness of the language itself um, for describing everything from quite simple reflections and rotations up to really kind of quite complex theories in physics, electrodynamics, relativity, and quantum mechanics, for example. But at the same time, the language was very approachable for a beginner. The language also has a quite an intriguing history. Uh, it goes back 150 years, uh, begins with Grassmann, uh, further developed by Clifford, and maybe most notably by Hestines in the last century, who added geometric calculus to it. And yet, despite its power and its ability to engage both the intuition and the logic parts of our brains, we don't teach it in our schools. Instead, we teach some ad hoc tools, which I think really obscure the underlying geometry rather than exposing it. And they quite often lack generality, running out of steam as we push them to uh, higher and higher levels. And this can be quite inefficient. So for example, we have complex numbers with their imaginary parts, the mysterious minus square root of minus one and all of that kind of thing. And really the true nature of these as subparts of the uh, two-dimensional plane is never really brought out. Um, vector algebra is another uh, example. We have the cross product, which only works in three dimensions. And this creates no end of confusion also because of the distinction between polar and axial vectors, what Richard Feynman used to call honest and dishonest vectors. And it doesn't really stop there. Vector analysis, um, the typical Gibbs vector analysis, um, tends to run out of steam when you want to do something like um, momentum conservation or angular momentum conservation uh, in electrodynamics and a lot of authors typically bail out and kind of like go to uh, tensors at that point which is such a, st a shame if, if we could have started with uh, perhaps a more unified language to begin with. Matrices also um, quite confusing uh, students often meet these in linear algebra and uh, they're expected in some sense to recognize that certain kinds of matrices represent geometric um, quantities just by virtue of the patterns of the numbers in them. Uh, but really, you know, again, we're, we're talking about uh, the geometrical interpretation being quite obscured. And so it goes on. We have quaternions, these things used by gamers. Um, their true uh, nature is never, I don't think it's ever really appreciated. Um, except by maybe a few, and um, people often think these are strange, mysterious, four-dimensional objects, when in fact, again, they are really subsets of a, of a three-dimensional uh, Euclidean algebra. The, um, the other case I could, I could mention would be something like uh, Pauli matrices and Dirac matrices, which occur in quantum mechanics, and Often these are thought of as being kind of fairly mysterious kind of beasts when, you know, again, they, they can really be tied very nicely to um, uh, their three and four dimensional spaces. So I think in teaching these methods and in not teaching geometric algebra, we're missing quite a big opportunity to accelerate the progress of our students and, and we're actually hampering them um, maybe to the extent that they just may never really understand um, truly you know, geometric um, physics and engineering um, just because they can't kind of connect the intuition to the mathematics. This would be a, a big shame as well for the subject of physics as a whole um, because it does appear that much of physics has this geometric base and that if it, if it could be expressed uh, nicely uh, using geometric algebra, then uh, I think that would be a good foundation for um, many advances. So with this in mind, I decided I wanted to do something about this situation, and that's how Geometry Zen came about uh, uh, being. 
uh, Geometry Zen is basically an online tool for um, performing geometric algebra calculations on a computer and it allows you to visualize the geometric result. Of course, it's not limited to just geometric algebra. I found that uh, um, it's been used by students as young as nine to uh, develop Python programs and play with computer graphics. Um, but really the sweet spot of what I was looking for uh, was probably the high school student uh, who was really wanting to um, explore geometric physics. So let's take a look here at a typical Geometry Zen program. Uh, we're here on the homepage of Geometry Zen at www.geometryzen.org. And I'm going to browse some of the existing examples. Go down to physics. And I'm going to pick here the charged particle, which is in the proximity of a current carrying wire. So the first thing you'll notice is that the code, the user code for this problem is written in Python. And uh, that was a very intentional uh, design decision to use a completely standard programming language. Because the idea really for Geometry Zen is that, you know, it's not a tool that you just use at some point in your career, but that you're able to use it for a good amount of time because it's quite a general purpose language. And by choosing uh, Python, uh, that's good not only because you'll be able to use Python, but also because um, it's pretty much an industry standard uh, in academia and um, also used in IT. So that's the Python aspect of it. Another reason why Python was chosen uh, was because of the operator overloading in Python. And that kind of creates a very natural syntax in the language for expressing mathematical notation. So there isn't this kind of like strange conversion you get when you use other languages that don't really support operators like plus um, and uh, multiplication um, between um, uh, special operators. So let's take a look at how this looks when you run it. I hit the run button. And as you can see here, we've got three dimensional graphics, WebGL running in the browser. And this is done through the 3.js library. Uh, the benefit for, of using the 3.js library is that uh, the uh, um, it's a very general purpose library. Uh, so you're not going to sort of run into sort of limitations because the library you know, can't do what you want. And um, there's, there's established documentation for it. Yeah, the final thing I want to show about Geometry Zen is the fact that there are built-in libraries for, um, for the geometric algebra. Here you can see part of them, for example, on line 28, um, you'll see the, the vector, Euclidean vector in three dimensions, um, and you see a scalar being expressed there. There are, of course, other parts, the bivectors, the pseudoscalars, and so forth. Um, but um, the important thing is that um, if you want to just write a demonstration program, um, there are a number of algebras av available, um, some of them just in Euclidean space, some of them in uh, a Lorentzian, so, so you can demonstrate um, special relativity as well. Of course, if you want to write your own algebra, you can do that, and that's probably a good exercise too um, for the student is to write a, a low dimensional algebra um, to, uh, to understand really how, um, how things are working under the covers. So that's um, Geometry Zen. Uh, there's nothing to install. It runs directly in your web browser. And uh, the most important thing I think to take away is really that it puts experiencing geometry into the hands of the student. So I hope this has given you uh, at least a, a little understanding of uh, the problem that Geometry Zen is trying to solve. And um, look forward to seeing you again, uh, hopefully in the next video, um, where I will describe how to actually use Geometry Zen. So I'm David Holmes, and until next time, goodbye.